Welcome everyone to a preview of the 2019 Ergo X Exoskeleton Symposium, Exoskeletons and in the Workplace and Beyond. I'm your moderator, Nick Rome. I'm joined today by Blake Arnsdorf. It's so great to be here with everybody. We are the host of Human Factors Cast, a weekly podcast about human factors every week. You can join us every Monday. Well, we're not here for us. We're here to talk about exoskeletons. Uh, so we are here as well with a panel of wonderful exoskeleton talent. Um, so let's just kind of go around the room here and uh, introduce everybody. So first up, we have Chris Reed. Uh, so Chris, can you just answer a couple questions for us? Who are you? What's your current position? You know, what's kind of your experience or specialty area? Hey guys, thanks for welcoming us on board. Uh, so my name is Chris Reed. I work for the Boeing Company. I'm an associate tech fellow in human factors and ergonomics. Um, and obviously I, I deal a lot with exoskeletons. Uh, so how long have you been working with exoskeletons? Uh, I've been dealing with exoskeletons for um, a little over four years now. So primarily looking at uh, how we can use it for industrial purposes, obviously for uh, manufacturing of aerospace products, but also working with uh, a few colleagues at ASTM for standardization efforts, looking across exoskeletons for medical devices, uh, as well as for military and industrial, of course. So exoskeletons, at least to me, is kind of a pretty niche area. How did you kind of get into researching or working with exoskeletons to begin with? Uh, so interesting enough, after grad school, I, I started uh, my first gig after finishing my PhD with the US Army as a human factors engineer. And so over there, I was working with personal protective equipment. So things like body armor, can bio garments, eye core, that kind of thing. So pretty much in the domain of wearable technology. Um, and that's where I started, I guess, uh, making my dent, cutting my teeth, so to say, on, on wearable tech. Um, from there, moved over to uh, NASA, working for Lockheed Martin, uh, and looking at designing spacesuits and helping assess spacesuits. So same thing on the wearable technology front. And then coming to Boeing, um, essentially doing the same thing now for exoskeleton. So leveraging all those different learning opportunities, those different experiences, and, and putting it towards the, the current agenda. Great. And what kind, of, uh, what kind of challenges do you sort of have while working with uh, these exoskeletons, either being designing or researching? Yeah, that's a great question. Challenges, they seem to pop up every day in the exoskeleton territory. Uh, really, I think the hardest part for me right now is taking on the, the cumulative load of all the exoskeleton technology that's out there. So just within the industrial domain alone, I mean, there's a plethora of exoskeletons that keep coming on board every year. And so having to keep up with that, we just don't have the resources. And so from a logistics standpoint, how do you deal with that? I don't think I have a perfect answer to that. And I, I think that's a, a universal question for folks like myself. Well, hopefully we can uh, at least get a little bit closer to the truth of that today. Where can everyone go and find your work or research if they want to follow what you're up to? Um, so the majority of my stuff will obviously be through the company, through uh, the Boeing company. So www.boeing.com. Um, outside of that, there's a number of publications and some media work that I've done. So I'm sure you can Google exoskeleton in my name and find a few things. Great. Thanks, Chris. Awesome. So today we also have Dr. Hongwei Sho joining us as well. So Dr. Hongwei, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about kind of the same line of questioning that we asked Chris. So what's your current position and what's your current experience and specialty area? Okay. My name is Hongwei Xiao. I serve as a chief for protective technology branch and also serve as a coordinator for the Center for Occupational Robotic Research at the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, or better known as NIOSH. As Chief of Protective Technology Branch, I supervise scientists conducting research and developing guidelines for workplace safety. Uh, I also manage eight state-of-the-art laboratory for NIOSH. As coordinator of the Robotic Center, I oversee center resource seminars and research and development of center research goal and objective. I also involved with a partnership with uh, Robotic Trade Association and research. I have a health engineering and management position in both the manufacturing industry and the US government. 
I also have taught uh, human factors engineering for occupational safety and health applications. Uh, my research covers anthropometry, biometrics, construction safety, human robot interface, and big data for personal equipment design and health protection. Wow, it sounds like your job so, and your breadth of work is really, really large. So what really brought you to getting involved with exoskeleton research and design? Okay, well, as a research agency, NIOSH managers and scientists keep their eyes on the future. Uh, we are keen on how we can leverage new technology and innovations to improve the safety and health of all workers. We, cause, uh, we focus on collaboration with partners and stakeholders on the use of and adoption of NIOSH knowledge intervention and technology. Uh, they increase the use of exoskeletons and also the breakthroughs in exoskeleton applications during the recent years prompt us to invest the resources for scientific efforts to guide the development and use of exoskeletons that enhance workers' safety and well-beings. Wow, so it sounds like you're impacting a lot of different types of workers who end up interacting with exoskeletons. So in your current job, what are kind of the main challenges that you feel like you face, whether it's in the design or research realm or even the management realm within exoskeleton technology? Yes, uh, NIOSH Robotics Center has identified 15 topics for research, and I see three important topics uh, with great challenges related to exoskeletons. Uh, they are the long-term impact of exoskeleton technologies as sources of and also intervention for workplace injury and illness. The second thing will be effect of size, fit, and range of motion of exoskeleton on users' acceptance and effectiveness of exoskeletons. And the third thing is perceived safety, situation awareness, ease of use, human exoskeleton communication modalities and safety procedure if exoskeleton systems show an unexpected encounter. Yeah, I mean, you're definitely really tackling some of the hard questions when it comes to getting, you know, standards put together behind exoskeletons for sure. So where could other people learn or find out more about the research or work that you do? Yeah, certainly audience who are interested in NIOSH research on exoskeletons, they can use keywords NIOSH exoskeletons or NIOSH robotics uh, to Google our report and scientific blog. Uh, the audience may also want to visit NIOSH anthropometry site for data that can be used for exoskeleton sizing research and for different occupational groups. Among the NIOSH blog and report are wearable, wearable exoskeletons to reduce physical load at the work or exoskeletons in construction applications. And also audience may want to Google our robotic website and also anthropometry website. Great, thanks Hongwei. Up next we have uh, Don Peterson, Dr. Don Peterson. Uh, uh, so can you tell us a little bit more about yourself? Uh, what's your current position and, and what kind of uh, experience area you are specializing in? Yes, sure, absolutely. Um, first, let me thank everybody for uh, for putting this on today. This is a, a, a great precursor to what we'll be doing in in October. Uh, so my name is Don Peterson. I am uh, dean and professor of mechanical engineering at uh, Northern uh, Illinois University. My experience has been um, primarily research experience has been uh, in exposure response and looking at those relationships, things from the the cell level. Uh, where I've gotten involved in looking at uh, bone and, and uh, endothelial cell expressions, uh, there were various exposures uh, and their responses to looking at uh, what could ultimately lead to identifications of onset of disease and, and so forth, uh, all the way up to uh, whole body systems, where um, in the exoskeleton realm, uh, I've been uh, working on, on developing uh, low-cost uh, exoskeletons, things that might be able to be uh, disposed uh, or dealt with very uh, cheaply in regards to uh, having effectiveness either in the occupational or uh, rehab setting. Um, the, uh, the, the rehabilitation exoskeleton is actually where I started uh, with, uh, with a grant from NASA many years ago to look at 
uh, developing a uh, exoskeleton that could be used in the International Space Station for retraining of astronauts uh, and, and isolating particular joint motions. Um, at the same time, looking at that technology's application here uh, on Earth and, and in regards to helping hemiplegics uh, return from um, uh, rehabilitation, uh, or I should say, towards uh, uh, alleviating their disorder regarding the uh, a stroke occurrence. What kind of challenges do you experience doing uh, the designing and researching of, of these exoskeletons? Well, one of the challenges, uh, so one of the other parts I wanted to say is that uh, I'm currently the chair of the ASTM F-48 uh, exoskeletons and exosuit. Uh, this is the standards uh, developments for uh, these types of devices. And that's primarily a really big uh, challenge in this community, not only if you are a researcher, but also if you are a developer. Uh, a user or a uh, maybe you're from a company and you want to understand which exoskeletons uh, uh, do what and how they perform, what are the risks are associated with those uh, exoskeletons. As an individual who's worked with rehab and now occupational exoskeletons in this development, uh, there's really not, nothing to follow in regards to standardization, uh, in regards to uh, thresholds and limits for uh, strength and performance, whether they be Again, uh, from an augmentation, strength augmentation standpoint, how well they augment strength or uh, from a, a range of motion or a cinematic type of relationship with the human body, how well the exoskeleton uh, is supposed to work uh, under what guidelines and what standards. So standards have been a, a really big challenge um, with this in trying to meet the uh, particular needs of the individuals that would use these or purchase them for use. Yeah, I'd imagine that's a huge challenge. Um, and I'm sure we'll jump more into deeper dive questions later, but where can everyone find uh, your work or research if they want to know more? Well, we have a website that you can look us up, but also uh, we've released some publications. I'm looking at some standardized methods for uh, testing exoskeletons, uh, following some work um, that we see in other standards uh, activities out there, whether it be ASTM or ISO. Uh, I'm also on the ISO uh, TC108 C4, which is the human uh, exposure to mechanical vibration and shock, um, where we've been quite active uh, in that community for many years and uh, looked at some of the standard approaches for uh, testing that PPE equipment for vibration reduction uh, and applied them to uh, scenarios of, of how, to, how to standardize a testing routine for uh, exoskeletons for certain types of, of tasks and so forth. So. Awesome. Thanks for sharing all those resources, Don. I'm sure those are great places that the audience will be able to check out. So next up, we also have Dr. Bill Morris with us. So Bill, tell us a little bit about yourself, kind of your current position, and what's your maybe experience or uh, specialty area right now? Well, first off, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, I'm Bill Maris, as uh, as was mentioned. And uh, I'm currently a professor at The Ohio State University. Um, I, I'm in several departments. My home department is integrated systems engineering, but I'm also part of orthopedic surgery, neurosurgery, as well as physical medicine and rehabilitation. Um, <clears throat> I'm also the director of the Spine Research Institute here at Ohio State, which is a collaborative effort between the College of Engineering and the College of Medicine. And what we try and do here is quantify the effects of uh, what happened in the spine uh, when you both try and prevent uh, musculoskeletal dis disorders to the spine, as well as when you try and treat people. <clears throat> so that's, that's where I spend my time. And I've been studying spines for uh, over 35 years. Wow, it sounds like a really incredible like, way to kind of transition into what kind of got you into exoskeletons or how did, did some of the research you've done medically looking at the spine kind of inspire you to look into exoskeletons? What's your affiliation with that technology? Well, exoskeletons are uh, a bit fascinating. Uh, some industries have come to us you know, it's starting about probably seven or eight years ago, uh, asking us to take a look at what it does to the human body. So that's where we got introduced to it. And then uh, over the years, more and more people have uh, come to us asking us to evaluate how these things impact the, uh, the human body. And it's not unlike, you know, what we've always tried to do is understand what the forces are that are imposed in the spine. And, you know, way back in the days when everybody was wondering about back belts, we were looking at the effects of those. And then we've moved on to, you know, what happens with ergonomic designs, and now we're up to exoskeletons. So uh, it's just a natural progression. And in terms of the clinical world, we're starting to see exoskeletons be a potential solution to help people, you know, move around and walk once they're disabled or as they grow elderly and can no longer control their muscles well. So I think it's going to be a, 
a real exciting area for not only the near future, but the long future too. Yeah, it definitely sounds like it, especially with the medical application. So in, in terms of your day-to-day -day job, what challenges are you really facing, whether it's in the research side or the application of your research to design of exoskeleton tech? Yeah, <clears throat> so um, let me talk about, um, I, I guess the challenges I see in exploring and coming up with good solutions to, uh, to the usability and user interface of exoskeletons. You know, there's, the way I look at it, there's both a, both a physical component such as, you know, what does it do to the body? What does it do to the, uh, the stress on the joints? And then there's also a cognitive uh, interface that I worry about a lot. You know, in other words, how does the person handshake with the exoskeleton? You know, what are they thinking when they move around? And is it intuitive to them or is it creating challenges for them? And to make things even more complicated, we're beginning to learn quite a bit about how the cognitive aspects of uh, the way people think influence the physical plant to the body and you know how it affects the loading of the spine and that's actually the biggest challenge I see is just trying to understand how exoskeletons the cognitive system and the physical system of the human all play together uh, to uh, to create challenges for uh, for whether these things are actually beneficial or not yeah, it's awesome that you guys are out there kind of doing this research and exploring these different ideas of how you combine basically the mind, the body, and then this technology outside of it. So if anybody wants to find out a little bit more about what you do, Bill, where could they find some of your research or some of your most recent work? Yeah, so, um, you know, there's a couple ways, uh, you know, just like everybody else, I've got a Google Scholar page, so that's easy. Or you can go to our website where we have all our publications listed. We have over 250 you know, journal publications and numerous presentations and things like that listed there. And the website is spine.osu.edu. And so just look up that and click on the publications button or the news button, and it'll get you to those publications. Hey, thanks, Bill. Well, I just want to give everybody kind of a preview of the remaining time that we have in this webinar. So up next, we'll kind of do a survey of what's going on at ErgoX 2019. We'll uh, kind of ask the panelists uh, a list of prepared questions, and then we'll kind of get on to audience questions. So if you have any questions for um, our panelists, please feel free to use the Q&A function in the webinar uh, to go ahead and ask away. If you have a question for a specific panelist, please indicate so in your questions. So that way we can uh, throw it over to them. Uh, so now that we know our panel a little bit better, let's jump into a preview of ErgoX 2019. So Chris, when you, me, and Blake met up last year, I think we, we, had a, we had a fun conversation. It was like, I think the words I used were the most nerdiest conference in the best way possible that we had ever been to because it was so focused, so specialized, and everyone there was just so kind of happy to be around this uh, centralized topic of exoskeletons. So uh, I, I'm going to throw it over to you, Chris. What can sort of people look forward to at Ergo X 2019 this year? <laughs> yeah, it's funny you mentioned uh, a bunch of nerds and geeks getting together because we're essentially throwing gasoline on that fire and and amping it up, so to say. Uh, so in addition to exoskeletons, we're also having a second track, a, a parallel or dueling track with augmented reality. Um, and not to go too much into augmented reality because I want to give them their opportunity to, to talk about it in the future and those co-chairs. Um, but it, it's really looking at uh, where the human factors and ergonomic society is going to help with uh, practitioners in the field and with developing technologies or disruptive technologies. And so augmented reality, exoskeletons, these are right on the precipice for affecting workers, affecting patients, uh, and hopefully doing it in positive ways. And so uh, this is where um, we're looking at putting together end users, researchers around humans, such as um, those in human factors and ergonomic society, as well as developers and hopefully coming up with a very user-friendly device. Um, and not only hardware, but also software as well. And so going back into exoskeletons, so essentially what we're looking at lining up for 2019, uh, learning from 2018, um, we are basically following up and doing a keynote. So this year our, our keynote presenter is gonna be Dr. John Howard, um, director of NIOSH. So he's gonna give us a taste of similar to what Hong Wei mentioned, um, touches of exoskeleton and how that entails with, with the NIOSH on the, on the government side of the house. Um, what we're continuing from last year 
is the developer and the user panel. And so the developer panel gets you three or four um, exoskeleton developers up there representing industrial exoskeletons, um, military um, exoskeletons, as well as medical exoskeletons. And then basically putting them on the hot seat and, and q and them. Um, they get to present their work, um, some of their lessons learned, their needs, their challenges, their gaps. Uh, and then at the same time, allowing that audience interaction. Um, ErgoX is, is keyed around that Q&A. So allowing time to throw out some seeding questions and topics um, from the panelists and then really opening it up to the audience and using that entire brain trust of the room to basically massage topics into future expectations or hopefully future deliverables. Yeah, I love that. So, so we're looking forward to those two panels. Do you have anything else you can talk about for ErgoX this year, even though, uh, well, well, let's talk about the things that are set in stone. Um, is there anything else we can look forward to? Yeah, so we do have a research panel, so to say. So we call them uh, research tracks one, two, and three. Uh, we're essentially looking at uh, sort of what, what Bill uh, was alluding to. So you have a physical panel dedicated to physical considerations and findings. Um, thinking of safety, ergonomics, biomechanics, physiology, things like that. But then you also have a cognitive panel um, dedicated to those questions about user interface and user experience and usability. Um, and then what's interesting is this year we actually have a debate session to close it out. So we're, we're basically going to throw out a couple of questions, um, put a bunch of panelists at a table, and watch the reaction. Um, uh, I'd like to joke around and call it rolling a grenade, uh, pulling the pin and rolling a grenade into a tent and see what reactions you get out of it. Uh, but they're obviously exoskeleton related, so TBD on that one. Yeah, well, it'll be fun to see what sticks and, and to see what comes out of that. Um, so I think right now, let's go ahead and roll into some, pair, from some prepared questions that we uh, came forward with for the panel. Um, and this one, we'll just kind of open up to everybody um, and uh, just kind of go down the line. As we get questions from you guys, the listeners, uh, the webinar attendees, we will, um, you know, kind of try to link those in if, if it's related to the topic. But I'm just going to throw this out to the panel. How can these devices help people that use them? No, so this is Don Peterson. Yeah, I mean, this, this, these devices are incredible. You hear from each of us about uh, the promise of these technologies. Um, you know, for, from, uh, again, performance in an occupational or industrial type of setting to performance in a rehabilitation or medical or even uh, performance in regards to uh, recreational. Uh, I know there's an exoskeleton that assists uh, in skiing. Um, and I, I believe it was a, a company, European company, that did, uh, developed that to, to be able to assist in skiing. So we see recreational as well. So I think these have tremendous potential um, across the board for a number of, of, of aspects, um, and including military. I mean, uh, uh, the, the, the technologies, the ability to make these devices link with us uh, from a human machine interface aspect, whether they be um, active or passive, uh, just the potential is so great that, um, uh, you know, they, they have a lot of promise, but then also comes back, circles back to why uh, we need to start looking at a standard approach uh, and the standards uh, and the impacts of standards on the development and implementation of these uh, safely so that uh, as, as exciting as they are, um, we're not out there injuring folks. Yeah, so you kind of touched on um, the, the different types, right? The, the rehab, medical, recreational, military um, I want to talk about commercial for a second, and this one actually comes from a question from one of our uh, webinar attendees from Anonymous. They write, are there any commercially available anterior exoskeletons for employees lying on their back, like on a creeper, but working with their arms over their chest or head? Is anyone aware of one of those? So uh, I don't know about any anterior exoskeletons at the moment, but I do know this scenario obviously plays heavily in the industrial workforce. Uh, for working on chairs or creepers, the exoskeletons that we've looked at, uh, it depends on the profile on the back. A lot of the exoskeleton um, uh, material, um, the way they offload around the body tend to be around the upper arms. Um, if they're holding the arms above the, the head, helping with posture. 
uh, or around the back of, of the torso. Um, so depending on how much surface area is covered, both um, around the, the uh, I guess you could say the surface area of the back as well as away from the back, think like depth in terms of maybe a backpack as an example, um, depending on how far back that goes, that could impede them from sitting on a seat. So I think the lower profile devices that are starting to come to bear in the market um, are, are potentially eligible for working in creepers. But again, I think these things need to be um, weeded out, so to say, um, to make sure they're, they're not gonna cause any pinch points or, or uh, safety concerns or biomechanical concerns. So I'll, and I'll just add to that, you know, some of the uh, developments, ongoing developments around soft robotics uh, may be something that's uh, compatible with those types of work conditions. Um, ourselves at uh, NIU, we're, we're working on a uh, immediately based exoskeleton, which would be the anterior uh, that this individual is talking about, um, primarily to be able to reach into tight and enclosed spaces to be able to use tools um, and provide some support in using those tools, not support replacement, or excuse me, strength replacement, but some additional support uh, to be able to uh, target a reduction into uh, into fatigue. So I would recommend to the individual to, to look around at some of the groups that are doing some soft robotics, um, might find more of, a, um, of what's going on currently and uh, what may be coming out soon. That's great, guys. So you guys all have such a broad space and understanding of how exoskeletons can be applied in different types of workplace settings or even in like a recreational context. So from each of your perspectives, I mean, what do you really consider to be exoskeletons as a whole, basically their strongest attributes for helping people? I guess I'll start out and then we can probably go down the line. So Chris again. Uh, so I, I would say if we break down industrial exoskeletons, they, they're primarily broken into the categories of postural assist, strength assist, and then uh, depending on what work environment or company you're in, there may be some form of assembly um, assist type exoskeleton. So think of maybe a supernumerary arm approach. Um, the, the, the strength of the exoskeleton is literally that. It's being able to mechanically leverage um, forces around your body rather than through your body, through the infrastructure of the exoskeleton itself. So whether it's helping your limbs or helping, uh, let's say a, a portion of your body like your torso, um, or, you know, helping you with strength enhancement as we start to go towards what we call the unicorn phase. It's the dream exoskeletons, uh, the ones that make you Iron Man. Um, that's, that's still to be determined. Um, but that's the aim, you know, helping with offload awkward postures, helping with uh, increasing on any kind of exertion related activities, uh, and helping with repetitive motion. Um, those are the big three in the ergo domain that we're trying to tackle. Um, when we leave industrial exoskeletons going over to the medical devices, if you can pick up a patient quite literally and walk them from A to B, uh, and they shouldn't be walking at all because they've had spinal injury or um, musculoskeletal um, problems, um, that's just really impressive. Uh, and so being able to help with, with patients, with uh, moving around, um, giving them back um, some kind of dignity to life that they lost through their injuries, um, that's just amazing. And then on the military side, you know, obviously the this, this strength that a lot of people are thinking of is the Iron Man itself, again, falling back to that analogy. So um, tactically being advantaged um, compared to a, a combat zone, uh, your enemies in a combat zone. So um, pretty interesting where this capability is going. Yeah, it's pretty incredible that you're spanning in so many ways one type of technology that can go from industrial of just helping somebody basically do their job to medical that almost gives somebody, I know I don't know any other way to really say it, but almost giving them a new lease on life, being able to maybe do things they weren't before or even help them recover during specific from specific injuries or anything like that. And then military, of course, we've got this kind of Iron Man unicorn complex that comes up. Um, so anybody else have kind of any thoughts about some of the stronger attributes? Um, thanks, Chris. Your answers were great. Yeah, this is uh, Bill Maris. So I guess the way I look at it is we have both passive exoskeletons as well as uh, active exoskeletons. Passive meaning they don't put any uh, energy into the body through motors, where with active ones, you are actually using motors. And in passive, it can release some of the load to a certain extent on the body uh, if they're used correctly. 
But I think the real future is going to be in active exoskeletons where we're actually, it's almost like power steering for the body, where you might be able to lift, you know, two or 300 pounds without, and it feels like maybe five or 10 pounds to you. So I think that's where the future uh, promise is, and that's the attribute that I'd be looking, uh, looking to, to, uh, to provide the best enhancement in industry if they're designed correctly. And I'm sure we'll get into some of that later. Um, but anyways, I, I think the, the power enhancement is intriguing in these things. Thank you. Yeah, I have, I have a quick follow-up question to that that that's not on this list, but I'm, I'm genuinely curious. It kind of goes along with that passive and active exoskeleton uh, concept that you mentioned there, Bill. Are there any pieces of media, be it like movies or television shows, that handles the portrayal of uh, exoskeletons in a way that's true to physics and biomechanics that you can think of that's, that's good for people to go and kind of look at? This question can be for anyone. <laughs> As Don Peterson, um, you know, our work in the exoskeleton realm, and certainly with uh, F48, the ASTM, um, that's a common question, believe it or not, uh, in regards to folks who want to kind of demonstrate for the folks that they work with and so forth, where are some, you know, publications, some literature, some media, uh, some hype video. Um, and, you know, I think some of the movies are getting better at how they portray uh, some of these things that are we're obviously way far off in our future, uh, primarily because of power um, uh, limitations and so forth. But um, that I can't necessarily pick out any good one, um, uh, you know, specifically. Uh, but, uh, you know, there's many of them uh, there that, uh, you know, I guess kind of demonstrate the general idea of, of how these things can be, um, you know, incredible in terms of assistive devices. Sure, I was I was mainly asking to satisfy my own curiosity, Bill. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Bill, ahead, Bill. Um, I, I guess the the movie that comes to mind <laughs> where I first saw an exoskeleton was Aliens, where uh, the very original one where Sigourney Weaver was wearing a uh, an exoskeleton to do material handling. Um, I, I think that's what it eventually could be. We're nowhere near that um, interface or that ease of use with them now, but I think that portrays the promise of it. And uh, what I don't understand about that movie is why you need a, an exoskeleton in outer space where there's no gravity. But anyways, uh, that, that shows what it could be. Great, did anyone else have any? Yeah, you guys are gonna really tap into the geekdom with that open answered question. That's just, <laughs> I mean, quite literally, with the power reserves, we're in need of an arc reactor. Um, coming from <laughs> Marvel. You know, if we had an arc reactor, we wouldn't have energy concerns. But um, outside of that, yeah, I think Edge of Tomorrow with Tom Cruise was fairly recent. Um, and it seemed to play on some of the, uh, the physical effects of the exoskeleton um, or the powered side of the house. Um, the other one that I thought was pretty cool was that uh, I think it was Matrix 3. Um, where they had those massive exoskeletons that you just kept loading cartridge after cartridge and bullet rounds into. Um, so, yeah, there, there's a lot of movies to pick on. Excellent. And, well, and I, was it, was it okay. Elysium with uh, Matt Damon as well? Was that the, the other one that had exoskeletons in it? Yeah, that's the one that came to my mind first. Um, so I don't, I don't want to, you know, we, we have about 20 minutes left of this webinar. I want to make sure we get to some more audience questions as well as some more of these questions that we prepared here. Uh, I'm going to ask one from Stephen Smith. Uh, what do you see as the extent exoskeleton development will influence the design and engineering of tools, the workstation, the work process, and so forth? So we'll kind of open this up, um, Danny. Yeah, no, this is Don Peterson again. Um, that kind of plays into our third question um, in regards to some of the uh, the design aspects uh, that have to go into this and, and look at it very carefully. Um, you know, as as these devices will have a bearing or an impact on how an individual moves. Um, you know, how how the device choreographs uh, well with the movement of the individual that's using it, and that doesn't mean that. From individual to individual, it's going to move the same way because we all move slightly differently based on our, our structure um, and our, our uh, you know our technique. Uh, so 
you know, it's going to in influence, uh, you know, is there going to be one silver bullet exoskeleton that's going to be able to solve everyone's problem? Probably not. I think there's going to be barriers of adjustability that have to over be overcome so that uh, different anthropometry, different movements and techniques and so forth can be accommodated within uh, a design or, um, or a given design. Maybe you see the designs in the future be more modular and fitted directly for an individual, much like uh, NASA tries to do with the spacesuit um, or other types of uh, military operations with uh, uh, equipment and so forth. So I think uh, uh, the other part of the work process is, is understanding then how the individual works with the machinery around it, whether it's a cobot situation, uh, the individual has an exoskeleton that's uh, maybe it's active, passive, or just even entirely active, and how that's going to communicate and work with the robots that are around it that may are not uh, not worn by people, but um, from AGVs to other types of things. Um, so the whole work process may change, uh, in that, and the uh, communication between the individual and the work process itself, if you want to call it that, communication probably interactions better. Um, the other aspect is, you know, what do these things do when individuals use tools? So from our standpoint, we're concerned with uh, when a person use a uses a vibratory tool, what happens? And does the vibration from the tools, the high-end uh, vibrations and the low-end vibrations, how do they get transmitted to the bodies in ways that uh, under normal use without an exoskeleton, body acts as a damper, the, you know, some of the vibrations won't even reach the spine, but in, in some of the cases of these exoskeletons, they will. So um, we have to pay attention to all these things. Yeah, so just to follow up, are you kind of thinking that, that uh, these tools and workstations will, will interface directly with the exoskeleton uh, kind of in conjunction with the human? Um, where, I, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm imagining kind of some like interface where uh, the exoskeleton maybe plugs into the workstation or the tool, like you were saying with, like, uh, with the spacesuits that NASA's uh, creating. Possibly. You know, and you know, as as our sensors and our abilities and the inexpensive aspects, you know, because some of these sensors that were thousands of dollars, you know, ten years ago are now seventeen dollars. Um, you know, that's all going to change, and and our ability to then link uh, between the uh, the person and and the machinery around them in a smart manufacturing environment. Um, you know, we don't know what's coming yet. We just know that it is it's a big wave of stuff that's going to be here. So. How that actually works is going to be another question, uh, and how it integrates, uh, I think, is another question. The augmented reality would be another aspect that would probably uh, play into uh, the cobot type of situation. So, um, yeah, again, we have to pay attention to all this. Yeah, it sounds like there's a wide variety of things you have to kind of research and plan for whenever you're trying to either design or even implement an exoskeleton into a brand new environment. So this kind of plays into our next question. So when you're really trying to consider like what needs to be worked on for exoskeletons? I mean, in the realms that you guys are working in, what do you still think needs working on or needs help from other researchers to better have better research considerations for either design or development for more effective human usage? So this is Chris. I think one thing that's um, popping up on uh, the industry side of the house is as exoskeletons move towards smart intelligence systems, um, how will they interface with um, your IT infrastructure? So let's say they're doing some transmitting now, um, both maybe hive mind style between exoskeletons uh, or between the uh, network of the infrastructure or out to the internet, maybe to the exoskeleton provider. Um, so how do we handle IT security um, and transmission on that side of the house? How do we deal with any kind of personally identifiable information. So luckily they don't exist yet, but doesn't mean they're not coming. And so how do we prepare our landscape for those types of new technologies and, and um, essentially leverage it at the same time so that we're not stuck in the stone age? I think that's some of the interesting stuff from my end. So for just trying to understand that concept a little bit more, I mean, and forgive the example, but is this kind of like gathering almost personal information as somebody goes to use an exoskeleton, almost like when you try and to log into your own phone and you give it some kind of thumb work, thumbprint password, or is this like beyond even just logging in and using your own exoskeleton? Yeah, you're hitting it on the head, Blake. So your, your thumbprint is essentially PII. That's unique to you. And so when you're going into an exoskeleton, depending on the system you're talking to, you can create a, a biometric signature for yourself. 
Um, and so you can quite literally identify Blake in an exoskeleton. Maybe that's by the way he moves, the way he walks, uh, his, uh, some health monitoring. Um, all of that would be captured on there. So um, really, it's how much is too much and what really do we need uh, as a requirement? What's our baseline? Absolutely, because I feel like that's a careful line to cross, especially like in, in times today with, when we're talking about cybersecurity or over in or even like sharing of biometrics, because you could, like you said, it could just be something as simple as your thumbprint, but it could also be analyzing your own behavior to make the skele exoskeleton work a little bit better with you. So that gets a little, little bit more sci-fi into it, but that's a excellent kind of point to think about. So from the rest of the panel, any kind of other real hard considerations we should be diving into to make sure that these things are effective or challenges that you feel like we that should be researched before kind of trying to develop any kind of exoskeletons? Uh, this is the way I can add a few words on this. Uh, the NIOSH musculoskeletal health program is interesting in knowing how to interpret existing guidelines, such as manual load handling and fatigue issues when a worker is augmented with this type of exoskeletons. And also, there are questions to be addressed about other exposures that may be increased in duration when this type of devices are promoted longer working time. Uh, would that have any effect on hand arm vibrations and also the uh, hours of work they're supposed to do? This is uh, Bill Maris again. So. Um, you know, one of the reasons we're so interested in this cognitive and physical interface is because if you do it wrong, things could get really bad really quickly. So the way I like to describe this is if you do it wrong, it's kind of like dancing with a really bad partner. And when you dance with a really bad partner, you know how clumsy that could be. And it causes all kinds of co-contractions of the muscles uh, throughout the body, which actually increases the loads on the tissues. And some of, the, uh, some of our studies have shown that with some exoskeletons, the loads on the spine are actually greater than they are if you don't use the exoskeleton at all, which I think could lead you down a very, very dangerous path. Uh, now, just to be fair, there are some exoskeletons we found are just fine, and they don't increase the load. Others show you know, a, a lack of, or a, a decrease in loading in other parts of the body, but for the spine, it's, it's very, very touchy. It could be good or it could be bad, and all exoskeletons are not created equal. So this is, these are the kinds of issues that keep me up at night wondering about how to, how to fix these problems, and, there, and everything is very context dependent. And what I mean by that is it depends what you're trying to do with the exoskeleton. So if you use one exoskeleton in a given situation may be great. It may provide load relief, increased stamina, uh, decreased fatigue, but that same exoskeleton performing a different operation may have the total opposite effects. So I think we have to be very careful as we go forward to use the right exoskeleton for the right condition and to work with the manufacturers to make sure that they're designed correctly and that the interfaces are um, well designed and consider all aspects of both the way people think, the way they interface with it haptically and biomechanically. I want to add to that too, because some of the things we're seeing, you know, some of the research we're doing is looking at some of these standard approaches, being able to test these and it, their ability again to choreograph with the individual. And there's some hinting that, you know, proprioception changes are going to happen, especially for those who have, um, uh, what you know would be, I guess, a lack of experience or training um, with the device. And maybe even in some situations, these devices have to be implemented in the workplace, but not after a lot of practice. You know, it's like don't go to the big game day until you, you know, you and your little device practices for uh, for a little while, uh, so that the individual understands uh, how to move and move correctly, as opposed to having um, anything aberrant happen that that you wouldn't want to see uh, in regards to the uh, the performance. So, um, you know, we're, we're also concerned with the, the that this changing uh, the, the playing ground for the person's perceptions of uh, what they're doing, how they're doing it. Just to finish up that thought too is, you know, when, when you take and you augment strength, um, what's going to happen? So I think uh, 
you know, fatiguing and a long-term fatiguing atrophy of muscles and things like that in a workplace environment with a lot of repetitive, maybe motions, lifting tools, things like that. So I think where the limitation is right now with these things is that there's really no longitudinal studies on these to look at them on, uh, over the course of say, uh, several years, few years or so. Yeah. The technology is still pretty new and, and it'll be interesting to see where it goes in the next couple of years. Um, I, I, so I know we have about 10 minutes left of the webinar, so I want to invite all of the participants again. If you have any questions, now's the time to ask. We'll make sure we can get to them uh, as many as we can in the next 10 minutes. So thinking about sort of, um, you know, help from researchers, users, regulatory agencies, standards. Uh, I know there's been a lot of talk about standards uh, in this presentation. Um, what kind of uh, help do you need to make these products more user-friendly uh, and sought after by customers? Like, how, how do we sell people on the idea of exoskeletons and, and um, you know, how, how do we get there? How do you, yeah. So Nick, this is Chris. I think it's a, a combinational approach. Uh, so up front, you probably have some early adopters in the space. Um, so for example, if you look at um, medical devices, medical exoskeletons, uh, I think recently we just heard about a uh, medical insurer now providing um, patient insurance to uh, exoskeletons for rehabilitation. Um, so that's the first, and that helps move the dial. Um, thinking towards industrial systems, early adopters for um, exoskeletons are primarily on the passive side of the house. Um, they're starting to move towards the active side um, when those you know, are slowly becoming available. They're still in kind of prototype phases. Um, but, you know, if you have uh, big names out there potentially saying we're using exoskeletons in X amount for X reasons, um, that helps move things along. But then also what comforts other folks is the science. I mean, quite literally, Don hit it on the head. What happens over the long term in these systems? We don't know. And we're still learning as we go. And how do we know what's effective? Um, which types of designs should be used without squashing um, the independent uh, design of the, uh, of the developer? Um, and so all of these are, are still open-ended questions that we're learning as we go. But what we do know um, is so far certain systems seem to be pretty good um, on the biomechanical side. What happens over the long term is still TBD, but um, we're starting to see that once we check a box that says effective or useful, um, then other folks will start leveraging that and, and jumping on board as well. So kind of sparking the fire, hopefully fanning the flames. Uh, this is a home way. I would like to tackle this question in a much higher level. Uh, I think the professional society-based uh, consortiums a national standard committee, industrial participation, and government engagement are the four pillars for successful implementation of engineering technology. So science-based recommendations through this four pillar collaborations, I emphasize collaborations, will further advance technology and provide users the best information for their decision in using the technology. That sounds great. I mean, both of you guys gave some really insightful answers into kind of what we can really expect or what we should really be tackling. So I'm going to jump towards the end a little bit here and kind of get us into dream mode or into futuristic land. So if you if we could envision a future where exoskeletons are much more commonly accepted and received by just the public eye or even the industrial eye, I mean, where would you like to see exoskeletons in the next three to five years in terms of capabilities, whether it's for the public sector or for in industry utilization? Okay, this is the way again, I will tackle on this one. I think exoskeletons with increased artificial intelligence have a good potential for use in healthcare, construction, manufacturing, emergency response, and warehousing applications where artificial intelligence can predict the readers or users' needs and assist them in their task in a collaborative manner, I think this would be something that I'm dreaming for. And I believe that it can be done in some way within the next few years. 
Excellent. I mean, the application of AI is always interesting. I can only imagine what kind of impact it could have for exoskeletons. Uh, any other panelists? Yeah, I, I agree with that as well. This is Tom Peterson. You know, I, I think the AI is going to be uh, in, uh, critical for this, and I think it's going to be embedded. I also think, as I mentioned earlier, with the sensing technologies becoming more accessible um, uh, within these uh, and inexpensive, uh, would be implemented into these systems. You know, smart manufacturing um, is up and coming, uh, quick response manufacturing, QRM, and all of that. I think that uh, this is going to play a serious role on um, human machine interface. Um, and the implementation of these exoskeletons. But I think also we want to see, uh, again, not, not just a, a really good standard in place uh, so that folks who are buying these things uh, and uh, being able to do so with an educated uh, decision-making process uh, regarding uh, the purchasing and implementation of them, but also be assured that they understand some of the limitations that these devices have as they're being implemented so that they can uh, control um, you know, use, uh, overuse or maybe misuse and so forth. So I think there's going to be uh, that embedded uh, smart manufacturing overlap as well as, again, uh, you know, in three to five years, we want a really good standard in place that assists the developers, the researchers, uh, the users, and the purchasers and so forth. Well, guys, it's coming up on the hour. I want to be respectful of your time. But before we go, uh, I want to ask one more question from uh, our webinar attendees. This is from Mohammed Al-Jamal. Uh, and this is something actually we like to ask in some interviews that we do for the podcast is uh, for a mechanical or, or product design engineer who's interested in developing affordable exoskeletons for developing markets, what would be a good way to start? So, so getting at that piece of advice for how to help people get into the field and, and kind of like what's one thing that you wish you knew when you got involved with exoskeletons. Let's just go down the list. We'll start with Chris. So I think this one's interesting because one of the things that we've been seeing is how uh, population accommodation, the ability to size and shape around an individual, really plays into the potential capability of the system. It directly is correlated. And so when you're looking at uh, your population, are these for children? Are these for elderly adults? Are they for men? Are they for women? Are they for certain regions of the world? Being able to adapt your exoskeleton to your exact market target um, would be ideal. And so knowing how to tailor in on, on anthropometry would be uh, one recommendation I'd put out there. Great. Uh, we'll go down the list here. Uh, Hongwei. Uh, yes. As a chief for protective technology branch, I always want the designers to thinking about the safety issues, particularly any emergency control uh, that you can build in in some way to educate users uh, in the event that something goes wrong. Great, and Don? Um, the, so what I would recommend for somebody who wants to get into developing these to kind of uh, get an accelerated path um, and build off of what's been learned thus far is get involved in the F48 for ASTM. This is the exoskeleton, exosuit standard. Uh, we have a great collection, about 130 something uh, or more or more folks that are participating in that uh, that standards development from, uh, you know, greater than uh, 15 countries. Um, this is a great way to, to, to we have twice, uh, we have two meetings twice a year, um, face to face, and we have uh, every month uh, the subcommittees of that standard uh, meet regularly. Um, that's a great way to really hit the ground running and catch up very fast with what's been happening and where things are going. So that would be my recommendation to the individual. Excellent. Thanks, Don. And uh, Bill, we'll end with you. Okay. Thank you. So, I would recommend um, paying attention to the interface. Uh, to me, I think that's where the major work has to be done. And that's something I wish I had a greater appreciation for when I started down this path. And, you know, back to our last question, just to sort of relate it to that, at least for the powered exoskeletons, I don't think we're going to be there in the next three to five years. I think we always overestimate the short term effects of technology and underestimate the long-term effects of technology. So I think it'll get there. I just think it's going to be longer than three to five years. Excellent. Well, thank you to everyone who wrote in for questions. Uh, and thank you, huge thank you to all of our panelists, Chris Reed, Hongwei Xiao, Don Peterson, and Bill Morris. Uh, I know I'm looking forward to ErgoX 2019, to nerd out with all you guys out there um, about exoskeletons and everything. 